We want to send a special thank you to Bailey Pottery Equipment and Ceramic Supply for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. At Bailey, you get the very best products along with extensive product information and excellent prices. In every line of equipment, you'll find functional features that teachers and professional potters have come to depend on. At the Bray, our Bailey gas kilns are the preferred choice among artists who create large work because they're easy to fire and very reliable. If you want to go big, go Bailey. For more information, visit baileypottery.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 409 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Katya McGurk and Vance Kohler about the Moravian Tile Works. This is an institution that dates back to the early 1900s when Henry Chapman Mercer built it in its current location in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. In our interview, we talk about the legacy of Mercer's aesthetics as well as his innovations as a tile maker. And we also talk about the recent revival of the facility under the not-for-profit Tile Works of Bucks County. If you're interested in finding out more information, you can do so at the website. That's thetileworks.org. Also, I want to take a minute to thank some of the folks that have donated to our show. I'd like to thank Susan Arno, Gay Smith, and Lucy Fagella for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can do so by visiting talesofaredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. So I'm going to start with you guys introducing yourselves. And if you can just give your name and then talk about what your position is here. And we'll start with you, Katja. Good morning. My name is Katja McGurk. I'm here at the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works in Doylestown, PA. And um, in April of 2021, uh, I formed a not-for-profit to be the operating company for uh, this facility, which is both a living um, or a National Historic Landmark, a working history museum, and a contemporary pottery. So we're overseeing everything. We all sort of started with the skeletal crew, and we're rolling up our sleeves and um, reviving the pottery. And I'm Vance Kohler. I'm curator here at the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works. And uh, I actually have been at the Tile Works since 1988 as curator, but uh, had a little hiatus prior to uh, this last year when uh, Katja took over and uh, have sort of rejoined the team. So I look after the collection. Uh, it's We have a very large and extensive historic collection of tools and plaster molds, uh, tiles, and paper. And uh, so I uh, care for that and uh, interpret the site for the public. Well, I wanted to start actually not talking about the tile works, but talking about Bucks County and where we are. Could either of you describe clay in Bucks County? Because this has been a clay-rich area for hundreds of years, and I think that sets the tone for the tile works. Well, yes. um, Clay making in Bucks County goes back into the 18th century. There were a number of small potteries uh, in various parts of the county, uh, making red ware. By the late 19th century, it was kind of dying out. Mercer recognized that and 
his initial venture into pottery was to reactivate a local redware maker. Uh, um, but he found out he couldn't, he couldn't learn the craft in two weeks, like he'd sort of planned. And so he um, sort of changed gears and decided to make tiles instead. But uh, that whole sort of redware revival in the late 19th century and then into the 20th century is actually due to Mercer. And so that sort of uh, all happens here in southeastern Pennsylvania. It was Henry Mercer that did the tile works, but it was a family, right, that that lived in this area, the Mercer family? Well, his family, yes, Mercer grew up in Doylestown, and uh, his family was here. Uh, his mother's side of the family was the Chapmans, and they were a, a, an old prominent family here in Bucks County in Doylestown. Uh, his grandfather was a judge and became a U.S. Uh, congressman. So they were prominent, and... Uh, his father had been in the military, but um, his, his family, his father's family was actually from Maryland and then settled in the Philadelphia area. So yes, uh, the, the family was here, and Mercer was born here and lived the majority of his life here in Doylestown. Starting a towel works is, in our day and time, you would think, okay, I, I might rent a garage, I might start small. This is not small. Like, he started a towel works that is massive. No, not really. Let's back up. Mercer comes to pottery making as kind of a midlife crisis. At the time, he's an archaeologist. Uh, he is associated with the University of Pennsylvania's museum. He's frustrated with his coworkers and his kind of research and, um, and rethinks what he wants to do with the rest of his life. And so he comes around to starting to collect tools uh, for the Bucks County Historical Society. A part of that was the pottery trade in Bucks County, of course. So in long about 1897, a mercer tries his hand at making redware. And he likes it. He likes how he can control his own life that way. So the next year, he actually launches his Moravian Pottery and Tile Works. He, he starts the, the business in September of 1898. Small. It was small. It was in his archaeological workshop in the gardens of the family estate Aldi here in Doylestown, which is about a mile from where we are right now. It's all gone. And Mercer is um, in a room pretty much the size of this room, laid out the same. Actually, this room that we're in right now was based on that first Indian house, he called it, his, stu his sort of archaeological workshop or studio. And that became the sort of showroom um, hub of his Moravian Pottery and Tile Works. And he occupied that space until 1912. This site is his second Moravian Pottery and Tile Works. And he starts it in uh, the fall of 1911 and completes it in the fall of 1912. And basically this structure is the buildings that formed the first pottery, which were separate buildings, but they're kind of like joined together and formed a, a, to look like a Spanish colonial mission. And by 1912, Mercer's a, a very well-established, very well-known figure in the American tile industry uh, as a, basically a, tuti, a studio tile maker, a very small operation compared to the industry that was just up the road in, or down the road in Trenton, um, which was a major center for the American tile industry. And uh, so what Mercer is doing is quite different what than what they were doing. But he was really very influential at that time, too. Okay, this makes way more sense <laughs> that you wouldn't start a tile business with uh, you know such a, a large place from the get-go. It did evolve. It did evolve, yes. Well, I, I wanted to also give the listener a sense of, of the scale of this. So, Katja, could you describe the buildings that we're in and how they were laid out for making versus firing and things like that? This is a courtyarded building. There's a balcony, arcaded balconies. There are six in two different corridors, six bottle kilns. With space left for two additional ones that were never, never built. So the, the room we're in right now 
his various names. Sometimes it was referred to as New Indian House. Actually, the men always referred to it as the big room. But this was the showroom for the pottery. This is the public space in the building. This is where architects, builders, contractors, clients would come to do business with Mercer's men, his staff. So this was uh, filled with samples, either, you know, finished tiles, mosaics, panels, uh, pottery. And, you know, it was set up a little different than we have it right now. But uh, that's how this room functioned. So it was, like I said, this was a public public room in the building, as well as the, the room adjacent to us, which was the manager's office. So these were important parts of the building. This is pretty much the extent of what the public saw of the business. Where we have our tile shop now was basically a warehouse for finished tiles. Building concrete shelves, there would have been movable wooden barrels and boxes full of finished tiles. And so that, that was a, kind of an important part of the business too. Um, above the shop area, and that wing, this wing of the building would have been storage for the plaster molds. They, and they did keep all that. The room um, above the studio up here was a layout room of sorts. The paper was kept there. Uh, drawings, correspondence, blueprints, they would have been stored in that space. And then the, the cross section of the building, it is kind of a U shape. It has actually built to look like a Spanish colonial mission uh, around a courtyard, an arcaded courtyard, open at one end, although they did build a wooden shed across the end to enclose it. And uh, so it was a work yard. And a lot of, a lot of work took place outside uh, all year round, uh, making tiles, setting tiles, whatever they needed to do, uh, because the building had no electricity and... Um, was not, it didn't have lights. So it would have been, uh, they worked in front of windows or they worked outside. The, the cross section between the two wings uh, was the small, what they would call a bottle kiln. It's because of the shape of the kiln. And those were the three active kilns used to load and fire the, the tiles in Saggers. And uh, the, other, the other wing of the building then that's parallel with the one we're currently in is production. And again, everything else took place over there. There was a drying room upstairs. Uh, they would press the tiles out. They were wet. They, they naturally dried them. But they had a room that they would put them in and heat so um, they would uh, eventually dry. Because they're, you know, they're plas- the clay is plastic clay. It's wet and usually needs to dry a couple of weeks. It depends on the time of year. And so they would you know, you know, roll the racks upstairs and let them dry in there. And so downstairs, uh, they would have made quarry tiles. They would have pressed out the decorative insert tiles. Uh, they would have assembled mosaics and panels and that kind of thing. When we were taking a tour before, we were looking at that work list you were showing me about the how much could someone make in it or how much could a pair of two people make in a day. And it was mind blowing. Like it was like three, it was multiple thousands of tiles. This was a smaller quarry tiles. I, I, I just didn't understand the volume, like just the volume of what could be, what was made here in the early 1900s was really impressive. Could you guys talk a little bit about that? Like how it actually like how much a pair of workers or a group of workers could make and how that would move through the building as they finish the, the tiles. It's important to th- remember that Mercer comes to tile making not an experienced worker in the tile industry. He actually looks at the, he looks at the history of the tile industry, mostly in Europe or the Middle East, and he, Mercer is trying to create tiles, as he said, that were artistic enough to rival the old ones, but cheap enough to sell. So he invents his own ways of making tiles. He, he develops these uh, metal and wood cutters. They're t- most, mostly two-part, where uh, the cutter house 
would cut into the 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 the, 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 the clay would be slabbed out flat and then the cutter would have been set on the top of the clay and pushed into it in, in the the wet clay tiles rise into the cutter and then it's got a wooden board with plungers in it that pushes the tiles out onto the wear boards so a cutter could make uh, you know usually multiple tiles at once so maybe maybe a dozen at a time you know in in half a day you can press out 500 tiles or so e- kind of easily two guys could I mean, they're doing this every day. Uh, the quarry tiles, the plain tiles, the, the floor tiles, uh, were the bread and butter of the business because that was what most people wanted. I mean, or they would they would buy the decorative inserts or the other fancier stuff, the expensive stuff, but the bulk of the business was quarry tiles, floor tiles. Yeah, and it made me think about price. Do you know about the prices at that time? How much would... Oh, yeah, we know. We pretty much know every... I hate to say that because there's are, there are of course a lot of holes of things I'd really like to know, but we know a lot because the order books, the ledger books survive. Uh, we're missing one order book in the 1920s, but it's actually covered in the ledgers, which we have all of those. The order books are kind of the day books when when an when an order came in, either through the door or through the mail or through an agent the order would be written into an order book, and that would be chronologically, day to day. And then when the order was finished and the bill was written and sent out with the order, they would go into the ledger. So they're cross-referenced that way. So we know all that stuff. Mercer had catalogs. Uh, he published four of them during his lifetime. And they, of course, are about the pricing. So we do know. I mean, I could say a 4 by 4 decorative glazed tile is $0.28, cents. Throughout most of the history of the company, uh, through Mercer's lifetime anyway, uh, until the 1930s. But that doesn't really give you a great sense of value for the, for the time. I do know other companies, even at that time, if Mercer's was 28 cents, a uh, 4 by 4 by American Caustic, American Caustic Tiling Company, which is one of the largest tiling companies in the country, could have been a dollar and a quarter for a similar tile. I think Mercer was relatively inexpensive, although compared to stuff that was even being imported at that time, he was considered a, an art tile and pricey-er than most. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good comparison, though, the 28 cents versus a dollar and well, a quarter. Well, something like that, yeah. yeah. To, to see how he was situating himself. But, you know, as a maker myself, I think of, you know, there's floor tiles, there's uh, more artistic tiles that might go in around, say, a, a fireplace like this. But then there's also these large three-dimensional mosaic-style uh, creations. So can you talk about that? And even the bigger ones, like some of these these bigger ones above the uh, the chimney there, like this would have been, I would imagine, installed <laughs> on a, the outside of a building, right? They were on the, yes, they were made for both uh, interior and exterior. There's actually a, a freeze of them on the exterior of this building. So not to, I don't want to dominate this whole thing, Katja, but fascinated. Okay, by well, here we go. I'm here we learning. Go. Okay, so Mercer sort of develops his aesthetic as a tile maker the longer he's making tiles. His early stuff, uh, the early stuff that he's doing, he's copying a lot of things. He's looking at uh, the history of European tile making. He's looking at medieval tiles, French, German. He's looking at Spanish tiles. Uh, He's uh, taking cast off of objects in his own collection. Uh, He's taking cast off of cast iron stove plates, which were incredibly influential throughout his entire life as a tile maker. And he's looking at those designs and translating them into clay. So the longer he's a tile maker, the more confident he becomes as a designer and develops new themes in his work. The, the panel next to us is Tiles of the New World. They're sort of episodes in the history of the discovery of the new world, uh, the myths of the new world, as well as the realities. There's natives crossing the Bering Straits. There's, there's a, a Native American making arrowheads, hoeing corn, uh, and then the, the Age of Exploration, uh, Ferdinand de Soto, and um, 
you know, Penn's treaty with the Indians, the, the pilgrims landing at Pil- uh, Plymouth Rock. These are all kind of themes uh, in his um, very large Tiles of the New World thing. And they're, they're uh, actually a style of tile that he invents. Um, it's, we, uh, uh, he called it uh, brocade. They're basically relief tiles that are in silhouette. And they are uh, multiple pieces. They're not really mosaics. Mosaics were always flat. Uh, but Mercer would call these tile panels. And uh, he did many, many different designs. The fireplace in this room are designs taken from cast iron stove plates made by the Pennsylvania Germans in the 18th century. Mercer was the great expert on those. He wrote a book called The Bible in Iron, and it, which is still a very valid piece of research. He uh, uh, was he assembled a huge collection of them for the, for the collection of the Mercer Museum. Uh, there's a whole room of them uh, um, on the fifth floor at the museum. Uh, but there, again, he's, uh, he's taking pressings or castings off these, pl- uh, these flat iron plates um, and then sort of retooling them uh, to make tiles. And uh, they were popular, and there's many installations of these uh, little stories of things that were found on these plates, like the miracle at Cana, the death of Absalom, David and Jonathan, Adam and Eve, things like that. Um, so there's that sort of thing. This style then develops, oh, when does he start doing that? About 1907 or 8. Uh, these, these are a little later. Uh, these, are, these really are about 1911 and 12. But uh, that style happens a little earlier, and then he kind of runs with it. He had a great modeler on his staff. Uh, Mercer would have never probably approached this style if it hadn't been for George Jacob Frank, who was um, a man he hired as a production guy who turned out to be a brilliant modeler and became the, then he became the staff modeler in 1907 to 8 and was here until 1917 and uh, really created some of the greatest things Mercer designed uh, um, as tiles. So... The mosaic styles are the flat style. That's what this other stuff is. They're flat pieces, like, like a puzzle often, or stained glass window, I guess, uh, is another good analogy. The, the Mercer actually patents this process and um, really uh, develops it kind of at first uh, for floor panels when he uh, uh, receives the commission for the state capitol in Harrisburg. The, the main floor of the Capitol is uh, an entire pavement of, um, I guess they're about, what are they, about three by three, four by four tiles, uh, just quarry tiles, and then interspersed are about uh, 300, 400 uh, mosaics, telling the history of Pennsylvania through uh, historical episodes, uh, everyday people, uh, flora, fauna, things like that. One of the things that's interesting is we're in this experience of the interview is that there's light coming in through these massive windows and you can, I can think about this as a showroom. It's really an effective way to see tile because with these brocades, you see shadow, you know, and these, the, the relief on these, some of these, it looks like are like two and a half inches deep. They are deep. Some of them are quite thick. Yeah, and, and it's really visually impressive. But yeah. one of the other things that that is unusual in my mind is is that a lot of these tiles were smoke fired or sagger fired in a kiln. But the effect is that it looks like smoke firing. Like some of the tiles are blacker, some are more red, some have slips that are white. Can you guys talk about the development of this? Because this is, I don't, I, I don't know if I've seen a lot of tile that has this type of finish. It is a process that he, he develops looking at Native American pottery. He was an archaeologist. He is very familiar with uh, the way North American Indians pit-fired pottery. And uh, he liked that the effect, the, the range of dark grays into white, uh, that, it could, that could happen. Mercer's method was basically put, put the unfired tiles, the you know, greenware into a sagger that's full of sawdust 
and then uh, seal it in the kiln. It's sort of this little reduction firing that actually chars the tiles. And he did that because it gave a great variety of color and uh, surface uh, to, you know, tiles that are being pressed out of molds. Uh, but it does retain this sort of individuality among the among each tile. So that was a kind of an important development for him. He was incredibly innovative. I mean, not really being part of the tile industry, kind of on the sort of on the fringe of it, lets him be a little freer and more uh, daring to experiment. And but actually, when he when he does develop something, he sort of sticks with it and doesn't really go beyond that. Like his colors, uh, he develops those really early, certainly by 1900. And he doesn't really vary them that much the rest of his career. They, the way they would vary them or evolve them really was uh, changing the clay body. from Mostly it was red, but he also used a, a buff clay and a white clay that came from New Jersey. And when you put some of the opaque glazes, the, what he would call enamels, the, in the industry they would have called them enamels at the time, it makes them brighter. And the, the whole, his, his whole thing... It's, I mean, like I said, there's this great progression in his work. It's subtle, but it is certainly there. And by the by the 20s, it, it, his work is full of color. And actually, it happens much earlier than that. It's more like the mid-teens and then into the 20s. And it really goes throughout. So it's really a lot about color, too. So like the, th- the panel hanging right behind you. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Scut is a proud sponsor of the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler. Scut Ceramic Products has been manufacturing equipment for potters since 1953. Their reputation as a pioneer in innovative kiln design continues with the fourth generation of this family-owned business. Their Kilnmaster touchscreen controller offers a sleek, smartphone-like interface that is both intuitive and packed with powerful tools that allow potters to easily program, diagnose, and remotely monitor their kilns. With five dedicated kiln technicians on staff and the most comprehensive network of distributors across the globe, you can be assured that SCUT will be there for you before and after the sale. For more information on their line of kilns, visit scut.com. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by Amico Brent. For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high-quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. As a maker, he was influential as a as a tile artist, but as he got older and eventually passes away, this place continued long beyond his life and has gone in ups and downs. <laughs> So can you guys talk about how things kind of ended in in his era and then were revived later on? Uh, let's see. Mercer dies in 1930, right when the Depression sort of took a, a hold of the nation. The late 20s for Mercer here was a busy, active time. Uh, business was good. The mid-20s till 1930. So he died in early 1930, so he didn't really see that decline. But he left the pottery to his assistant, his, the manager of the pottery, Frank King Swain. Frank held on to it. By 1932, though, when the Depression really took, a foot, took hold of this country and business was just horrible, uh, Frank let all the men go, except two. He kept uh, B- uh, Benny Barnes and Jim Rosenberger on, basically because they were his friends, and he wanted to make sure they had something to do. 
And so he uh, had those guys here. But during that period in the 30s, there was a, the, only those two men were here. And some orders came in. There wasn't much. And then with World War II, there were government restrictions on uh, making building supplies, right? But after the war, things did slightly improve. Uh, they did hire a, a helper, and uh, he, he was here. And so they did keep the doors open. Frank died in 1954, and uh, uh, he left the site to a nephew who lived uh, in the Philadelphia area. The nephew had high hopes, actually issued a new catalog. I um, mean, there was some, inter- you know, the building was kind of booming in this country in that, in that period after World War II, and churches were being built, and so there was a slight demand for the stuff. But he uh, had an offer from a local man to buy the site, and um, that was in 56. And so the nephew sold the pottery uh, to, a, to a man. And the, the two guys that had been here since, well, Benny had been here since 1910, and Jim Rosenberger, his actually, actually his real name was Oscar, but they all called him Jim. Oscar had started here in 1904. So they had been here for a very long time. But in 1956, they both quit because they did not like the new owner. So this, the new owner had absolutely no idea how to make tiles. He did try. I got to give him that. He did. He, he tried. He made a few things. Uh, but by the early 60s, uh, he was pretty much done with it. Offered, uh, it basically had the place kind of boarded up, you know, sort of uh, very quiet here in the, in the 60s. Uh, he offered it to the county of Bucks as a historic site kind of park it, that, at this time uh the county's parks parks department was actually um handling uh fawn hill park uh it was a county park and uh so the county uh was very interested in acquiring this site and um but they were nego- they negotiated for several years there were some lawsuits involved uh there was a couple of big yard sales at that time things were being like just given away or sold and then in 67, the county actually did come to terms with that owner and settled on a price. And then in, so in 67, the county of Bucks acquired this building and the grounds, uh, this little section of ground that it's on. It would open to the public in 69 as a museum. And then in 1974, tile making was reactivated as a, a little summer exercise at first, but then it sort of did take off from there. So we've actually been reactivated as a tile making facility since 1974. Katja, can you talk about when you came here in the eighties, what you were looking for? Like as a, a young artist, what, what inter- interested you in this place? When I came here early in the eighties, I came from Rhode Island school of design and this is, back before there was any internet or any real, Mercer wasn't studied in college then like he is now um, in terms of the history of ceramics and the ceramic arts and industry in this country. And I happened to have some friends from Bucks County who told me about this place. And the minute I visited here, I knew I wanted to work here. And I'd moved back to our family farm in Maryland and had begun This is from Newport, Rhode Island in 1983. And I uh, came up here with a tile. I'd been interested in tile making in terms of a decorative art. I loved design. I loved architecture. I loved painting. But when I landed on ceramics, it felt like um, I wanted to make something that was decorative yet useful. So when I came here, I'm like, that's what I want to do. So um, I was lucky enough to just walk in with a tile in my hand and said, I want to work here. And I got the job. Um, shortly after that, being just a production ceramist, I ended up um, being hired to be the production manager, which I did for about a year. Back then, it was different than it evolved. But in the 80s, this was a place where lots of people that were tile curious, really, were coming through. Lots of people who later went on to become very successful tile makers in their own, in terms of the national market, 
came and studied under Mercer. He was very influential. And people came, studied for a while, you learned what you needed to do, and then you adapted it to your own work. So that's indeed what I ended up deciding I would start my own tile business. So I had already had a tile business in 1981 in Newport, Rhode Island, called Fountain Street Tile Works. And after I left the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works, I started a little street level business here and started just selling tiles in galleries and then got jobs that I had to produce the tile. So I was like, oh, I'd like my craft, which I can make these tiles support my art. Um, and eventually there was more and more demand for my tile. So that took over. And I've had a long, like I said, I've been making tiles for 41 years. And it's an hour long story how I ended up here having a seat here today. But it was a mini epiphany, really, in the middle of the night, one night. I'd, I'd long been gone from here. I'd had many iterations of what my work was around, um, from running a factory, small factory with like eight people, um, at the maximum selling tiles in the high end kitchen and bath market. I did quite a bit of teaching, eventually sort of fell into doing a lot of public art and community built projects. And uh, the latest thing I was doing was working in a uh, marginalized neighborhood in North Philly, reviving a, a tile studio down there that one of my mentors, Lily Ye, the barefoot artist, had started. When I saw this place, basically the administration, people who had been here for years and years, when I saw them aging out and I saw this place slowly Vance's position as the curator had been eliminated and it hurt my soul to think of the a museum being run without a curator like a ship without a captain and I just had a vision and I was like if I don't act on this and say something and I had all kinds of ideas how this place could just with few tweaks really have some new life breathed into it and become relevant again I have this obsession with relevancy and sort of coming off what Mercer, what drove him was sort of wanting to not forget how people made things, why people made things with the industrial era coming hard, um, you know, pushing that sort of handmaidenness out. And I just saw ourselves in this same time now is same but different where you have this age of information or age of technology and misinformation coming up and people really forgetting how to make things and why we make things and skill building and seeing that sort of working class uh, disappear. So I feel like I'm driven by the same thing, just trying to keep this place uh, you know, relevant and alive. And so I did. I went to the um, county commissioners and said, listen, I really think this place needs a, a facelift. And they listened to me. And it went on and on and on from there, two and a half years of negotiating with the county till I really realized I'm supposed to do this work. Sort of all of my tile roads led me to this my involvement with the Tile Heritage Foundation, which is in Healdsburg, California, are the um, collectors of the tile history of this nation. The storytelling definitely is a common thread for me, too. Tiles that tell stories, not just decorative for the sake of being decorative. So um, it was a lot about relationships and relevancy and certainly love for this site that um, I realized I was supposed to put together a terrific team to create this not-for-profit, and we're seeing a real uptick in, in the architectural and installation market. We're seeing uh, people happy to be coming here and more people finding out about it, and there's just a lot more fun happening here, too. Yeah. Can we talk about how you're integrating the different parts of this this building into a cohesive thing. So you have a, a living history museum. You have a tile works that's actively producing 
and then in general, you're also taking big orders. So can you talk about like, how do you balance that as a whole between the workers that are working here? It's running three different businesses, like you said, and the task at hand, it's a heavy lift. The tile, we already have reputation, you know, we have style, we have a name. So all of that sort of is, is just carries forward. In terms of craftsmen and hand making, there's a balance always there because we're trying to be as true to the way Mercer made stuff as we can be, but we're our, you know, sort of neo-craftsmen as well. You're, you've got a gas kiln now. We're not firing with coal. But we're definitely, in terms of a mission, that is the most important thing, I think, to keep in mind that we want to honor the past to inspire the future. And that becomes the thing that drives everything we do. We want to check in with that and make sure what we're doing is mission-based. So even if we're having a bluegrass concert series or something, we, we want it to be something about storytelling, tradition, that kind of thing. We have talented artists here. We want artists to have um, an important part of what we think is that artists deserve to have a living wage. And uh, that's important to me to keep that as part of what we're doing. And anything that's done in the spirit of Mercer, sort of that spirit of innovation and experimentation is what we're interested in. So it kind of can go across mediums. It doesn't have to be all clay. Right now we have a fellow here who started a micro enterprise kind of by accident, but he's turned all of our tiles into linoleum blocks and is doing these beautiful bespoke clothing line and bags and things like that. Well, to wrap up, I wanted to talk about where you guys see this going, you know, because we've been talking about hundreds, a hundred years of history going back or more than that. What do you want to be in, in five or 10 years? Like, where do you guys think there's potential for growth with this? We want it to be here a thousand years from now, I say. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be building a reinforced concrete building with no um, expansion joints. Basically, the formula for me is to make sure that we have a next generation, and that's a big topic. Like, who's going to value this? Who wants to work this hard? But really getting the next generation interested in this place and invested. So bringing them in in any way we can with their families and through the schools and through it, you know, outreach and education and programming, getting them here and getting them to care about this place, I think is going to be what holds it up eventually. So when you think about this, Vance, how, how do you think that this history that you can present through the museum, how do you think it benefits people today, like in, in Bucks County? the citizens, or people like me that come from other places to see it? I'll answer just for Vance for a second here, and then as he sort of looks, in the, and this is just one of the joys of being in the room here today with, with you, is that I'm hearing stories. Vance is the foremost scholar on Henry Mercer, and the timeline that he was able to just specifically talk about, I was you know, I don't know it like Vance knows it. And it's important that that story doesn't die and that go to the grave with, you know, him. So we really want to capture everything that Vance knows and that you came up with this podcast. It's just great. I think more and more people will get interested in what we're doing here just by hearing what's going on. Perhaps he'll write a book. I would hope that's in his future. Um, being the keeper of this place and just interpreting the site, like he said, I just, he, he knows everything. It's wonderful. <laughs> well, currently we're, I'm in the process of uh, dealing with our 6,000 piece mold collection. It's something I've, look, I've been here since 1988. There was a, a period when I wasn't, but uh, the, the, you know, I've dealt with this mold collection now. <laughs> So for more than 30 years. Longer than Mercer. <laughs> Back in the day, we did it on paper. Everything's on paper. Uh, they, I mean, they are sort of catalog. They are cataloged. 
but we're trying to bring them up to uh, more proper museum standards with the cataloging and then the images of them. And hopefully at some point in the future, um, our mold collection will be visually uh, accessible by, uh, by the public in some way. Uh, that's still to be determined how that's going to evolve. Currently, um, you know, it, I feel like it's my sort of um, calling to uh, get these the information about these molds accurate. So I'm working on that a lot. And uh, so that hopefully that would benefit the public at some point to know more about uh, what Mercer actually achieved as a tile maker, as an artist. We have to think of him more as an artist too, so not just a tile maker. So to wrap up, can you leave the website or a way that people could find out about this? And, and can also you plug any future events that are coming up this spring? We, the operating entity that we created, this 501c3, is called the Tile Works of Bucks County. And you can find us on the web at thetileworks.org. On Instagram, at the Tile Works, that's where we're putting a lot of our, our upcoming events. Our biggest thing is the Tile Festival coming up in May, May 21st and 22nd, and that's uh, antique, vintage, and contemporary tile, as well as some demonstrations and tile-related things happening that weekend. And people come from all around the world. We have a woman who's come from Russia, um, Alaska. So that's our big signature event, and we hope it will become, if it is not already, the premier tile festival in the country. We have a visiting artist called Sherry Warner Hunter who will be teaching a um, armature workshop hybrid. Uh, she does cement and mosaic big 3D sculptures. And we have a bluegrass series coming up this summer. So it's going to be a fun time. Yeah, sounds like it. Well, thank you both for your time. It was really a pleasure to talk with you today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I'd like to thank Katya and Vance for their time. It was a pleasure to visit and to see that amazing space. If you're interested in taking a tour of the facility, you can do that by getting in touch with them. You can do that through their website or through the Tileworks on Instagram. Before we go, I'd like to thank today's sponsors, the first of which is Bailey. They make a variety of ceramic equipment and make amazing large-scale gas kilns. If you want to go big, go Bailey. For more information, visit baileypottery.com. Our second sponsor for today is Amico Brent. They have been a longtime sponsor of this podcast as well as a longtime maker of ceramic supplies for our community. If you'd like to find out more about what they have to offer from underglazes to electric kilns, visit amico.com. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Scut Ceramic Products for sponsoring this episode of the show. Their Kilnmaster touchscreen controller offers a sleek smartphone-like interface that allows you to program, diagnose, and remotely monitor your kiln. For more information, visit scut.com. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. 
by acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag on our native land initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.